Good morning. My name is Peter Toy, and I'm one of the English pastors at Bridal Trail Baptist Church. Thank you for deciding to join with us today as we look into God's Word together. Today we'll be continuing in our series in the books, Book of Acts, and we'll be looking at Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 10. And the title for this message is, Two Characteristics for Effective Ministry. But before we look into God's Word together, let's look to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to meet with you. And Lord, I pray that you, by your Spirit, would have mercy upon us, and that you would speak to us, quiet our hearts, by your Spirit, whisper into our ears, let us hear your voice. And Father, after we hear you, please bless us with the power and the grace to obey so that our lives may be transformed and that your kingdom may be built, that the name of Jesus Christ would be glorified. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. How do we effectively fulfill our mission? Once you have your call, once you know your vocation, how can you have a fruitful ministry? In this passage this morning, we'll be looking at that very question. And from this passage, we can discern two key characteristics that are essential for ministry. The first characteristic is this. It has to be a team-based ministry. And the second characteristic is this. It has to be a spirit-led ministry. We'll look at both of those in turn. Let's look at the first point, to have a team-based ministry. Giving you a little recap of what's gone on in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas have gone on their first missionary journey. They return back to their sending city of Antioch, and then Paul gets the idea to go on another journey. He and Barnabas get together. And they want to go together, but there's a problem. Barnabas wants to take along John Mark. Now, John Mark had accompanied them on their first journey, but halfway through, he left them. He abandoned them. And Paul didn't want to take John Mark. He had lost his faith in him. And this got into such a big argument that Barnabas and Paul, they broke up. They went their separate ways. Barnabas took John Mark, and they went on to Cyprus. Meanwhile, Paul, he began to ministry, but Paul did not go by himself. He went and he found another Christian, a companion, by the name of Silas. We're introduced to Silas in Acts chapter 15. We found out that he was a leader in the church of Jerusalem, and he also was a prophet who could encourage the other believers, just the sort of person that Paul wanted to have. But as Paul went on, this, his first journey, he wasn't satisfied with just one companion. He recruited another. Take a look at Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in the area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. I have three observations about these verses. The first observation is, don't go it alone. You know, often when I think about the Apostle Paul, I think of kind of a lone ranger missionary who stood alone against the Jews and the Gentiles that attacked him and proclaimed the gospel fearlessly. But as you read the, the actual account in Acts, that wasn't true at all. Paul almost never was alone. Okay, there were times when he was imprisoned and he was separated from his companions. But when Paul had a choice, he always went with other people. You just have to read through the book of Acts and you'll see that on his missionary trips, he always had people around him. Let me just read off some of the names of the people, the people that we know of who accompanied Paul. 
Ms. Barnabas, John Mark, Silas, Timothy, Aquila, and Priscilla, Erastus, Sopater, Aristarchus, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Tychicus, Tri Trifumus, and we also know that Luke also went with him, the author of this book. And we know from stories that there are other companions as well, most notably Titus, who he wrote a book to. Paul believed in this principle. We were never meant to minister by ourselves. And we have to learn that too. Just think about it. Even Jesus didn't minister on his own. After he went out in the wilderness and was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, when he returned, one of the first things that he did was he recruited 12 disciples to be with him and to minister with him. I think there's a few reasons why we need other people. The first reason, reason is we don't have all of the gifts. That, Paul makes that clear when he writes in 1 Corinthians and compares the church to a body. This is what he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 18 to 20. But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. God designed us to need one another. Wherever we go, whatever we do, we have to do it as a body. A second reason we need to be in a team-based ministry is that we need mutual encouragement. I think there's a reason why Jesus sent out the 12 and then later on the 72 in pairs. You know, in ministry, there's just so many ways that we can be discouraged. We have challenges with our culture with an enemy, the Satan, that wants to destroy us, with, with fear in ourselves. We need someone beside us to encourage us and so we can carry on. When we used to do evangelism in the mall, we never went out by ourselves. We always went out in pairs, and when we had an odd number, we'd have groups of three because we just needed that kind of encouragement to continue to go and meet people and present the gospel to them. And there's a third reason that we should be in team-based ministry. And it's this, we need to train up other people. And we can do that when we are in a team, especially when you think about Timothy. Timothy was like a son to Paul in many ways. And Paul wanted to encourage Timothy to follow in his footsteps. He says exactly that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. What you heard from me keep us the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So my first observation is don't go it alone. My second observation from these verses is we have to choose the right person. You know, it's crucial the person that we pick to be on our team. One person who doesn't fit well they can destroy the whole team. When Paul chose Timothy, first he checked out his background. He found out that Timothy was from a mixed background. His mother was a Jew and she was Christian as well. But his, his father was a Greek. He also found out about his references. He heard from the other Christians, the other brothers in Iconium and Lystra that Timothy was a person that you could rely on. The last thing that Paul wanted was another person like John Mark who would desert him in the middle of his missionary trip. And you know, it's important for us as we look for a team, co-workers that we can join with, who can join with us, that we pick people who we can work well with. And it's important to check out someone's gifts, their beliefs, what skills they have, what experience they have. Those are all important. But probably more important is when we check out someone's character traits. And I'm thinking about character traits like um, we find the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the kind of qualities that we should find in our co-workers because those kind of qualities pull a team together rather than ripping it apart. Well, we looked at 
a couple of observations. First is don't go it alone. The second one is choose the right person. But the third observation from these verses is that we need to prepare the team. You see, when Paul chose Timothy, they didn't just go off to the next city and begin ministry. Paul very purposely chose to do something. It says it in verse 3. It says, So he circumcised him. Before he could bring Timothy into ministry, he had him circumcised. Now, you might read that and you might wonder, well, why? Why did Paul do that? In fact, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Acts chapter 15. And when Jews came from Jerusalem and demanded that Gentiles be circumcised, Paul stood against them. And he debated sharply against them that Gentiles did not have to be circumcised, that they did not have to obey the Old Testament laws to be saved. Now, was Paul being a hypocrite here? Was he changing his mind? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons why Paul felt it was appropriate here to circumcise Timothy. The first reason is that Timothy wasn't a pure Greek. We find out that Timothy was of a mixed heritage. His mother was a Jew. His father was a Greek. And we find out in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3.15 that Timothy's mother raised him up so he would know the Old Testament. In a lot of ways, culturally, Timothy was a Jew. So when he was circumcised, it wasn't so much changing a Gentile into a Jew. It was more like um, confirming his cultural choice, that he already was a Jew. A, a second reason why Paul thought the circumcision of Timothy was proper was that there was a completely different reason for the circumcision. You see, when the Jews from Jerusalem came, they demanded that the Gentiles be circumcised so that they could be saved. It's an issue of salvation. But for Timothy, that wasn't the issue at all. It says in verse 3, the reason that Paul wanted to circumcise Timothy was that they'd be going to regions with Jews, non-Christian Jews, and they, some of them would know that Timothy was part Greek and part Jew. And if he wasn't circumcised, what they could take offense and because of that they would stop listening to the gospel so you, you see the reason for paul circumcising timothy it had nothing to do with salvation it had everything to do with a missionary strategy paul didn't want to put up any stumbling blocks for the non-christian jews to hear the gospel and to believe and Paul wrote about this directly in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 to 20. This was his perspective. This is the values that he held. He says, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. You see, Paul wanted to remove any obstacle or any stumbling block for the gospel to go forth so that people could hear and be saved. I wonder, in your life, are there any obstacles keeping you from fulfilling your calling, from having a fruitful ministry? Now, you may wonder, well, what could those obstacles be? Well, I, I think of the parable of the sower and the seeds that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13. And in the story, there are four kinds of soil where the seed fell. The seed was the word of God. And the first kind of soil where the seed fell was on the hard path. And when it fell on the hard path, the birds came and ate it up. And Jesus said that those birds represent the devil. The devil took the word away. 
And maybe your greatest obstacle is that. Maybe you have heard the word of God before. Maybe you've even gotten church services. Maybe you've heard the gospel preached. But it's, you've never taken it in yourself. It's never taken root in your life. It's all, the word's always been snatched away from you. If you're honest with yourself, you'd have to say that you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never surrendered your life to Him and to follow Him. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is only a prayer away. If you sincerely come to Him, if you confess your sins, if you ask for the gift of eternal life and you surrender your life to Him, then He'll hear. He'll see the sincerity of your heart and He'll answer your prayer. The second kind of soil is seed that fell on the rocky, shallow soil. And in the soil, the seeds germinated, the plants came up. But when the sun came out, because the roots were so shallow, the sun burnt up the plants and they were unfruitful. And it may be that your obstacle to responding to the call of God, your obstacle to having a, a fruitful ministry, is that you don't want to face any hardship or persecution or suffering. That's why you don't share the gospel with your non-Christian friends or relatives, because you're afraid of rejection. That's why you'll never think about going on the mission field, because you don't want to... Um, suffer hardship. You don't want to go without um, going to Starbucks and having something to drink or going through a drive through and getting McDonald's french fries. You're afraid of going to certain countries because you hear it's not safe. Those are an obstacle for you. There's a third kind of soil. And this is a seed that fell on ground that was filled with weeds. And when the seed came up, the weeds also grew up with the plants. And the weeds choked the plants out. And in the Bible it says that these weeds are the deceitfulness of wealth, the pleasures of this world, and the worries of life. It may be that your obstacle in following the will of God and responding to His call upon you is that you have chosen to have different goals than to build the kingdom of God. Maybe you're pursuing getting the best marks in school. Maybe you want to be popular. Maybe you want to make a whole bunch of money. Or maybe you're enslaved by some addiction. Um, maybe that you're addicted to playing video games or watching Netflix or pornography or online shopping or a hundred other things. Let me warn you. If you want to get rid of these obstacles, it's going to be costly. It's going to be painful. <laughs> think about Timothy. Think about what he had to go through when he had a circumcision. Do you think that that was a comfortable thing? He was an adult. No, that I, I cringe when I think about it. But Timothy was willing to do anything so that he could have a fruitful ministry and he could respond to God's call on his life. The results are worth it. Take a look at what happens in um, Acts chapter 16, in verses 4 and 5, as Paul and his team go out. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his team had a fruitful ministry. And that's the fourth kind of soil. The fourth kind of soil is rich soil, good soil, where the seed sprouts and bears a crop a hundred times of what was sown. The sacrifice is worth it. What obstacles do you have in your life? What is keeping you from obeying God, following His call on your life, 
and seeing a fruitful ministry. Well, we've looked at the first quality, the first characteristic of an effective ministry, having a team-based ministry. Now I want to look at the second characteristic, having a spirit-led ministry. Take a look at Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 10. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From this passage, these verses, we get the picture of how Paul did ministry. Paul followed the leading of the Holy Spirit on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. Where the Spirit told him to go, he, he went. Where the Spirit prevented him to go, he didn't go. You know, I think for many of us who are involved in Christian ministry, this is foreign to how we do ministry. This isn't how we do ministry. How we usually do ministry is maybe we survey the need. Maybe we look around our neighborhood and see what people are asking for. Then we look at our own resources. Um, how much money do we have? What facilities can we use? Um, what staff can we recruit? What kind of skills, what kind of gifts do they have? And then taking all those in account, we kind of pull together a program that will attract people so we can share the gospel with them. And then after we have our plans together, then we lay them before the Lord and we ask Him to bless them. But that's not how Paul did ministry. His ministry was Spirit-led. He listened for the Spirit to guide him and then he followed. And that kind of perspective makes a whole lot of sense. And after all, God is the one who is building his kingdom. And he has his plan. He doesn't need us to tell him what we think would be a good idea. He already has his idea and his idea is best. What we need to do is we need to humble ourselves. And we need to find out what God's plan is and then join Him in His plan. Not ask Him to join us in our plan. God spoke through the Holy Spirit in three specific times in these verses. The first time is in verse 6. It says that Paul and his companions were traveling through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. And then they came to the border of Asia. And they crossed over into Asia. But as they crossed into Asia, the Spirit spoke to them and told them while they're in this region, they were not to proclaim the gospel. They, it doesn't say they had a reason, but they obeyed what the Spirit tell, told them, and they didn't. And then as they went through Asia, they cut up and they came to the northern border of Bithynia. And their plan was to cross over into Bithynia and start preaching the gospel there. But again, we see in verse 7 that the Spirit prevented them from going into that region. They, they couldn't even enter in the territory. So instead, they had to change direction and go all the way out west to Troas. If you look on the map, that, that's quite a journey out of their original path. And then God spoke a third time. And this, time, and this is found in verse 9. And this communication from the Holy Spirit is given to us in a little more detail. In, in this case, it was at nighttime, and Paul had a vision. And in the vision, he saw a man from Macedonia calling them over to come to Macedonia and help them. And they took that as the leading of God, and they made plans immediately to set sail and to go over to Macedonia. You know, it's clear in these verses that God spoke through the Holy Spirit. And I think maybe we should spend a little bit of time of looking about how does God speak. Now we know that God speaks in many ways. 
at different times to anyone that he chooses to. In fact, in the book of Acts, if we just restrict ourselves to examining that, we see many ways that、um, God spoke. He spoke through the appearance of angels. We see that at the ascension story. We see that、um, when Peter and the apostles were in prison, the angel appeared. We see that with Cornelius when the angel appeared to him. And for some people, Jesus Christ Himself appeared. He appeared to Stephen when he was being stoned to death, and he appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. And another way, Jesus, another way that God speaks in the Book of Acts is through visions. We see that with Ananias when God gave him a vision about going to Paul and praying for him so he could be healed, so he could see. There's a story about Peter seeing the vision of a sheet being lowered down, and There's a story here about the man from Macedonia, but probably what's the most common way that people heard God speak in the Book of Acts was through a voice, and that happens in numerous occasions. We see that with Philip in Acts chapter eight, verse twenty-nine, says the Spirit told Philip, "Go to that chariot and stay near it." It happened with Peter. When he heard the spe- spirit speak in Acts chapter ten, verses nineteen and twenty, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, "Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them." And the Holy Spirit spoke to the church in Antioch in Acts chapter thirteen, verse two, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, "Set apart for me Barnabas and Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called." Them, and we get the examples in this passage with、um, the Holy Spirit speaking to Paul and his team, preventing them from going from preaching in Asia and going into Bithynia. How? What do we make of this? How do we hear God speak, like Paul and his team? Henry Blackaby he wrote in his book Experience of God. That there are four ways that we can hear God speak to us. We can hear God speak through the Holy Spirit by number one, by His Word; number two, by the church; number three, through circumstances; and number four, through prayer. And these are all important ways where God speaks. When we talk about God speaking through the Word, for me, that is the way that God most commonly speaks to me. I, I read the. The Bible and a verse jumps out at me, and it speaks to my situation. And we, many of us, experience God speaking through the church. Maybe you hear heard a message, and the speaker, the preacher, he, he spoke something that was directed straight to your heart. It felt like. And we've also, many of us, have had experiences of of God speaking through circumstances. That happens usually when an, an opportunity opens up. Often we never expected to open up before, or maybe a door closes and a chapter of our life life ends. And God directs us away from a place where we, we were serving before. But this morning, I want to spend a majority of the time looking at the fourth way that God speaks, and that is through prayer. And the reason I want to focus on this is because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about how God can speak through prayer, and even the idea of what really the essence of prayer is. And I think in the New Testament, this is how God primarily spoke to people. Like when you think about Paul when he went to Asia, it wasn't like he was studying the Bible and he. Heard God saying through the Bible that He wasn't supposed to preach in Asia. It wasn't like、um, there are other Christians who told Him not to preach in Asia, and it wasn't like there are circumstances that prevented Him from preaching in Asia. In fact, circumstances probably would have led Him to preach in Asia. God spoke to Him through prayer. Now, when I say through prayer, you may get the idea of、um, kneeling down beside your bed and closing your eyes and folding your hands, but that's a very limited picture of prayer. We we have to expand our idea of what prayer is. First Thessalonians chapter five verse seventeen says, 
pray continually. Prayer is much more than just set times where we choose to talk to God. In fact, prayer is more than just talking to God. You know, often that's what we think. In fact, sometimes when I I talk to my granddaughter, Tabitha, I'll say something like, All right, Tabitha, let's pray. Let's talk to God. That, that's how I divine, define prayer. But prayer is much more than just us talking to God. At its heart, prayer is any way that we can communicate with God. And if you think about it, communication always has to be two ways. If it's not two ways, then it's not communication. Have you ever um, had a friend and every time you got into a conversation with him, this friend would just keep talking and you couldn't even get a word in edgewise? Do you like talking with that kind of person? How deep is that kind of relationship? Not very deep. But you know, often I think in prayer, that's how we treat God. When we come to God, we tell Him all of our needs, all of our worries. We share with Him all our concerns, maybe even things that we're angry at Him for. And then we leave. We don't let Him respond. Prayer has to be two ways. And for prayer to be two ways, then we have to spend time and listen. That means we have to quiet our hearts, still our spirits, and spend time in silence. Leighton Ford wrote, When I am still, compulsion gives way to compunction. That is, God can break through the many layers with which I protect myself so that I can hear his word and be poised to listen. In perpetual motion, I can mistake the flow of my adrenaline for the moving of the Holy Spirit. I can live in the illusion that I am ultimately in control of my destiny and my daily affairs. French philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal observed that most of our human problems come because we don't know how to sit still in our rooms for an hour. We have to prepare ourselves, train ourselves to be still before God so we can hear His voice. For Paul, and for his team, hearing God's voice through the Holy Spirit, that was their ministry strategy. That's how they determined where to go, what to do. G. Campbell Morgan wrote, The doctrine of the inner life is not sufficiently taught. To the individual believer, who is by the very fact of relationship to Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, there is granted the direct impression of the Spirit of God on the Spirit of man, imparting the knowledge of His will in matters of the smallest and greatest importance. This has to be sought out and waited for. Tyrion Morgan is saying, he's saying it's the privilege of us as Christians, because the Holy Spirit lives within us, to be able to get direction from the Holy Spirit through impressions, through words, through images, and to be able to follow the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. And that's how Paul and the apostles, that's how they operated. Now, how can we do that in real life? How can we make Paul's way of ministry, a spirit-led ministry, our way of ministry. Well, let me give you a couple of suggestions. <sighs> Incorporate a time of silence in your regular prayer life. If you don't have that, begin that. Let me suggest setting aside 10 minutes of silence every day. And during that 10 minutes of silence, concentrate on emptying your mind of all distractions and settling and quieting your heart, and then opening yourself up to the Spirit of God and allow God to speak to you. Try that for every day this week. Just experiment with it. See what happens. See what happens with your prayer life. See what happens with your relationship with God. My second suggestion is this. Ask God first, and then listen 
for an answer. Ask God first and then listen for an answer. It may be that you have a question in terms of your ministry. Maybe you want to reach out to your neighborhood with the gospel. Well, instead of just thinking of your own idea and going out and doing it, first pray and ask God to show you what He wants you to do. After all, God is much more invested in seeing your neighbors saved and come to faith than you are. He loves them much more than you do. And after you ask that question, after you pray, then wait. Wait in silence. Wait for an answer. See if he speaks to you. Maybe he'll give you a word. Maybe you'll get um, an image, a picture. And if you don't, keep praying and keep waiting until God does answer. Now you may ask me, Peter, how do I know that that a voice I hear or that um, impression I get, that that's really from God? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I want to spend some time answering that question. Really, there's only a few places where we can get thoughts from. Our thoughts can come from ourselves, our thoughts can come from the devil, or our thoughts can come from God. And the Bible tells us that we need to discern the spirits. We need to be wise to determine where these thoughts, these voices, these images, where do they come from? I think the place to start is having a close relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus in John chapter 10, he compared himself to a shepherd and he called us his sheep. John chapter 10 verses 4 and 5 says, When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Hear what Jesus is saying? The closer we follow Jesus Christ, the more we come to know him and understand his him, then we'll recognize his voice. We'll recognize the spirit, the tenor of his voice. You see, being able to hear from God and our relationship with God, they're intrinsically linked. We can't expect to hear from God if we don't have a close relationship with him. But saying that, let me make a few comments about the tenor and the spirit of the voice of God. Dallas Willard writes in his book, Hearing God, three ways that we can recognize God's voice. First way is this. The voice of God has the weight of authority. When we hear the voice of God, it has a weight to it, a permanence to it, that is above our other thoughts and thinking. E. Stanley Jones, he writes this, Perhaps the rough distinction is this, The voice of the subconscious argues with you, tries to convince you, but the inner voice of God does not argue, does not try to convince you. It just speaks, and it is self-authenticating. It has the feel of the voice of God within it. A second way we can recognize God's voice, it has the spirit of Jesus. Willard writes, It's a spirit of exalted peacefulness and confidence, of joy, of sweet reasonableness, and of goodwill. It is, in short, the spirit of Jesus. And by that phrase, I refer to the overall tone and internal dynamics of his personal life as a whole. The third way we can tell if it is the word of God is by the content of the message. Again, Willard writes, the content of a word that is truly from God will always conform to and be consistent with the truths about God's nature and kingdom that are made clear in the Bible. So when we listen to God, when we hear His voice, keep those three characteristics in mind. The weight of authority, the spirit of Jesus, and the content of the message. One last thing I want to touch on is 
that after we hear the word of God, then we must obey him. You know, for Paul and for his team, it wasn't good enough just to hear God's word. It changed what they did. They stopped preaching the gospel in Asia, stopped them from going into Bithynia. And after they had the vision of a man from Macedonia, well, they made plans immediately to set sail from Troas over to Macedonia. In the same way, you know, it's great to hear the word of God. But it, hearing the word of God alone is not enough. We have to obey what the Holy Spirit tells us to do. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And maybe that's a good place to end this message. In this message, you've heard many different applications. Why don't you ask God what he wants you to do in response to his word today? What invitation does he have for you? What call does he have on your life? We're going to end this time in prayer. And during our time of prayer, we're going to ask God and then have a time of silence. And during that time of silence, listen and hear God speak. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you choose to speak to us. And Father, you know us. You know us so well. You know how we need to change. I pray right now during this time of silence that you would make it clear to us what you want us to do in response to your word. Show us how you want us to apply what we've heard. Father, thank you. Thank you for speaking to us. Now, please, give us the courage and the strength and the power to follow you and obey you. That I, our lives might be changed and that your kingdom may be built and that glory may come to the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.